Well, we're going to move on to a new type of uh, use of the MSO 5000. And that is, when you're working with uh, a number of logic signals in a, in a bus uh, kind of parallel arrangement. Now, it's not necessarily a bus. It can be a bunch of independent uh, logic signals that you want to look at. But the idea is that you're looking for a pattern, a particular set of ones and zeros on a group of uh, logic bits that uh, you would like to trigger on. And so there are two triggers in the MSO 5000 that are useful for this. One is called pattern trigger and the other is called duration trigger. Now you may notice that the trigger I'm using is the duration trigger and we'll talk about why we why I chose that one rather than pattern in a minute. But let's basically talk about what's going on here. Notice that what we are triggering on is the uh, height of this sine wave up here. But we're not triggering actually on the sine wave which is on channel 1. Instead what we are triggering on is when all of these data bits that are shown below on the logic analyzer are a1. And uh, that is the time when this output, which this is a digital to analog converter, when, when all of the digital inputs are a1 is when the D to A converter produces its highest level. So why are we doing this? Because there might be a particular pattern that we uh, are noting does not seem to work correctly. So we, we want to pick the digital inputs to the D to A converter to trigger on, not the output. Because the output might be uh, some sort of intermediate level that it's hard to set a, uh, any of the normal analog triggers uh, to that level. So what is what is all this uh, show? Well you see here a uh, the, the pattern that we are looking at. Notice that on the far left is channel 1 through channel 4 and notice that we set all of those to X which means don't care or another way is Forget those. Disregard those. Don't pay any attention to channel 1 through 4. We have also set X's to everything from channel 8 through 15. Don't pay any attention to those. We say only pay attention to D0 through D7. And we want to trigger when all of those bits are a 1. So, uh, we'll, we'll go through the setup on this in just a minute, but uh, the, the basic idea is that when all of these are a 1 is this point in time and notice that that is where the trigger is and we are using a duration trigger. Now I said I would explain why we're using duration instead of pattern. Pattern is exactly the same as duration except the duration trigger allows you to say only trigger when this pattern has existed for a duration of time. And you can set what that duration of time is. We have it set to one microsecond. And notice it says when greater than. In other words, we're saying when the pattern that we have set on this pattern uh, menu exists for more than one microsecond. So why do you want to use duration? Well, we'll uh, take a look in a minute at what could happen. But if one or more of these signals have uh, any kind of noise on them, if that noise causes a signal that should be a zero to appear briefly as a one, then it will get considered as a 1 at that instant in time. And we may not want to do that. 
The particular signal that I'm working with, or the board, is the DS6000 and the data bits to the DAC are a little bit noisy. So let's go over to a pattern trigger using exactly the same pattern and you notice that it gets very unstable and that's because there is a little bit of noise on the, the DDA uh, inputs. However, that noise is very quick. It's uh, way less than a microsecond wide. So if we use a duration trigger, we get a stable trace. Now notice also that we're using a normal trigger, not an auto trigger up here. You can get fooled with the pattern real easily if you try to use auto trigger uh, because then it gets rather complicated in terms of uh, re-triggers that uh, may occur in auto triggers. So I recommend, as I said in some previous videos, that you try to use normal trigger for everything you're doing. And keep an eye on the triggered signal up here so that you'll uh, know that you are actually triggering on your source. So let's take a quick look at the uh, at why we once again are using duration trigger and then we'll come back and talk about setting this up. So I put together this little diagram to show you what we're talking about here. Suppose that, uh, and we're just using three bits here, but suppose the pattern you want to see is a one on this uh, bit, a one on this bit, and a zero on this bit. The, uh, but suppose that what is happening is that you're getting a one on this bit, a one on this bit, but this bit goes to a zero for just a brief instant of time. It will then think, the, the pattern trigger will then think you're seeing this. Well, but you're not. And so the duration trigger will let you decide whether you want to consider this or not. Now, there are times when you might want to look for that, and there are times when you might want to just trigger when it stays stable for, for a period of time. And so that is the difference between the pattern trigger, which does not account for time, and the duration trigger, which says the pattern must exist for a period of time uh, that you can set as either it must exist for more than that time, or it must exist for less than that time where you're looking for glitches. So now let's look at how we set up a pattern or a duration trigger on the MSO5000. So of course the first thing we have to do is we have to select the type of uh, trigger. And notice that we have here duration. So I'm just going to click on that. And of course uh, you can do this with the uh, multifunction key on the front panel by just pressing the multifunction key the same way I like to use the mouse as you probably already know. And now this trigger comes up and it says the source and you need to make sure that the source you select is either the data signals or one of the analog channels. In our case we want to trigger on the data signals, so we have selected D15, it could be D0, it doesn't really matter which one you pick. Uh, as long as you pick a, a data signal, then all of the data signals that are enabled will be considered. Notice now that a pattern uh, window appears or menu appears. Make sure if you're using digital signals that you have turned all of the analogs to an X, to a don't care. Otherwise, it will try to consider those as well as part of the pattern. Now, there may be times when that is part of the pattern, so in that case, you would, of course, want to set those to whatever that value is. But the uh, if you're just triggering on digital signals, it's a good idea to set all of those you're not interested in to an X, which means I don't care about those, don't pay attention to them. So notice that we have D0, through D7 set to 1. And we can do that 
by simply clicking on the uh, the bit position that we want to work with and then it will allow you to enter. For example, if we want this to be 0, 0 and then all 1's. Now it will trigger on that, but notice that that never happens. Notice that the wait state up here. Uh, so that trigger condition never occurs. So we're now going to set them back to 1, 1. And notice now that we are triggered and that they are all 1's right down this trigger line. So that is how you set up the uh, both the duration and pattern trigger. When you're using the duration trigger there's an additional setting which is when and then you decide either greater than, less than, uh, greater or less than, or between two values. And then in this case we've selected greater than and then you set the value to, in our case, we have set it to one microsecond. And you are now triggering on a case when all seven of these are a one, and that pattern has existed for at least one microsecond. So, uh, uh, I'm I'm now going to uh, wax nostalgic for, for a couple of minutes, but uh, for those of you that just want to see how to set up a pattern or, or duration trigger, you can uh, end the video here. But for those of you that might be interested in a, in a war story, uh, stay tuned for another couple of minutes. So a little nostalgic war story here. Back in the day, and here I'm talking late 60s, early 70s, when TTL logic had just come out and you needed to troubleshoot your design. If you needed to do what we've been doing for the last few minutes with the MSO 5000, in other words, trigger on a pattern, the way you did it, at least the way I did it, and I used to keep a little couple of these built up on uh, on perf boards in my desk in those days. This is a 7430. In this case it's actually an S30 which is a high speed shot key uh, 30. But it's an 8 input NAND gate. And this is a little dip switch. What you would do is you would wire your inputs to a set of inverters and then the, this dip switch would select between either the, uh, the logic high or the inverted logic low signal to apply to this 8 input NAND gate. Therefore you would get 8 bits of information applied to the NAND gate and I'll show you a, a spec sheet on this in just a minute. And then you took the output of this NAND gate to the trigger input of your oscilloscope. And of course those were the days when there were no digital oscilloscopes either. And so you, you were using, in this case, a Tektronix 551. And this is the way you did pattern triggering before digital oscilloscopes came along and enabled you to do all of this in the logic of the oscilloscope. So let's take a look at the uh, data sheet for this NAND gate for just a second and, and then I'll, I'll close with a, a little suggestion for another video to watch. So here is the data sheet for the 54 or 7430. Uh, notice it's also a uh, uh, the S30 is the one in the far right and this is what it the logic looked like. It had eight inputs when all of them were a 1, the output would go to a 0. So you would set these up with the uh, either the signal or the inverted signal that you wanted to look for, and then you would trigger on the falling edge, that is when this output went from a 1 to a 0. In your, uh, 
in your analog oscilloscope. So that's the way it was done back in the day. It, it's a whole lot easier today. So let me now show you a video that I suggest you might want to watch if this is interesting to you. So here is a video done by Curious Mark. I'll show you the title and everything here in a second. He's working on an HP 9825, which is a very old Hewlett Packard calculator uh, built with these, with all TTL logic. This is a little uh, test clip. Uh, I kept these in my desk too. And you'll notice that he has some signals that he's uh, clipped to with these clip leads. And what he's trying to do is uh, debug this uh, this 9825. This is the third part of a three-part uh, series in which he works on a 9825 and it's probably as good an example of the kind of logic analysis that uh, had to be done back in the time of this, I think this uh, this device was designed in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, I'm not really sure. But uh, the uh, channel is Curious Mark, C-U-R-I-O-U-S-M-A-R-C on YouTube. And this is part three of the, and he call, says, Logic Analyzer to the Rescue. Now he's using a modern logic analyzer. The first logic analyzer I ever used I was home built with wire wrap uh, and TTL circuits. And uh, back in the day, the good ones cost $10,000. I built mine for about $50 worth of parts. And they came in very handy. But I thought you might be, if you're interested in, in how things used to be, uh, it might make you appreciate how much easier a lot of things are today than they were back then. Now, I'm not one of these people who said, oh, you know, everything was harder in the old days. Actually, this was pretty much uh, a lot of fun, at least for people like me that are basically lab rats. But you may be interested in taking a look at this, and if so, I, I won't uh, do any more in terms of spoiling the, uh, the surprise. Go back and watch all three of these and you'll get a real feel for how we would troubleshoot TTL logic back in the day. So I hope you've enjoyed what we've done so far with the MSO 5000 and you'll stay tuned for some more. But as I always do, I wish you stay safe and have a nice day.